All right, welcome into another edition of the Ryan and Goodman podcast. I'm Jeff Goodman. He's Bob Ryan. And uh, the mass one over here is Celtics coach Brad Stevens, who's in the office. And uh, Brad, you're looking good, even with your uh, with your with your mask over there. Yeah, thanks. It's a uh, we've actually been tested pretty regularly over here since um, the NBA let guys back in to work out in the facilities. And we've had a few of our younger players back here for um, a little bit of time now. So it's been good, but it's, uh, but yeah, it's, you still want to make sure we're doing everything we can to uh, be preventative. Is it crazy, Brad, that we are a month away from the start of the NBA season right now, less than a month away? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's really wild. I mean, just coming back from Orlando, we were, we were thinking that, and and I think everybody thought that we were probably looking at a mid January start. So, um, you know, there was always a chance that, that there would be a decision to start earlier, but usually when you, when you say mid January, that usually means later, you know, you you usually think that's probably not going to happen. Um, but, uh, yeah. So when we got the news a couple of weeks ago that this thing might get ramped up even quicker, um, it does change some things. And, you know, obviously with the draft free agency and then the st- first practice with all the new COVID protocols, with all the facility requirements that we're going to have not being in a bubble. Um, and they're all coming like memo after memo rushed in. Um, it's quite a lot of moving parts right now. Uh, and for our staff, you know, it's, 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 we're pretty focused now on how we can best play. Um, you know, cause you know, the majority of your team. Uh, and so you just kind of go from there, but it, prior to that, you know, before the draft, before free agency, that's a little bit more difficult. Yeah. Well, speaking of the draft, um, uh, the, uh, apparent, uh, activity of the Celtics to us on the outside was, uh, something that is not always acknowledged on the inside and in other years was drafting for a need. Uh, I don't know whether Mr. Neesmith was the highest guy ranked on your board or the first guy ranked on the shooters, but uh, and you, you got a shooter. And I don't think it's a secret that it's something you could use. Yeah, well, we got two. Yeah, um, we got two. Both those guys can really shoot the ball. And, uh, and but yeah, Neesmith is, is big, gets it off, gets it off easy, shoots it high. He can run off screens. You know, I thought one of the things that I appreciated about watching him before the draft was the way that Stackhouse had run him off all the different actions and unique things. Like you would run an ATO or you'd run off a set um, and he could shoot it with his body weight going away from the basket. And there's just not a lot of guys that can do that um, and make it at a highly efficient rate. And to shoot what he did, even in a short amount of games, in a small sample with those level of shots is, was a pretty impressive, um, really, really, uh, bright guy and, and, and a worker. And I think he's got a lot of good basketball ahead of him. Obviously, you know, the key is for, for him or anybody else coming in is how quickly can you make the adjustment to impact the game and add value to winning by doing what you do best and learning, to be able to manage those other areas as you're learning how to kind of survive in the NBA. Um, And then Pritchard is just a, he's just a tough, a tough little guy. He's not little. I mean, he's, he's 200 pounds, strong, physical, um, and uh, has all the shiftiness and all the different reads and all those things and, and can shoot the ball as well. So, we, uh, we thought that was really important. You can never have enough guys that can put the ball in the basket. Um, and you know, we'll see how this all pans out. They don't get the benefit, Bob, of summer league screwing up three on three games in August and September when no one else is here. And then, uh, going into practice, they have to go into practice next week. (laughs) So that'll be quite an adjustment for these draft picks all over the NBA. Is there any kind of Bob, the first time I ever heard Gordon Hayward's name, I don't know if Brad remembers this. But a few times when I would come to Butler, we would meet at a, a little coffee shop. I don't remember the name, but it was it was close to, to camp, like a cafe type deal. And uh, you remember the name, Brad? Cafe Patachu. Is that what it was? So I would go by every year 
really before Butler was even great, um, I would go by every year and, and see Brad and sit down with him and either his, his assistants. And one year he tells me, he's like, yeah, I got this kid coming in named Gordon Hayward. And uh, I think he's going to be pretty good. And, you know, a tennis player and his sister is a tennis player. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know, whatever. <laughs> then I saw them later that year. I came back for a game against, I believe it was Loyola. And, uh, and Brad, I, I actually, it was so funny because when I left the gym, I called Danny and I said, oh, I yeah. think I just saw a lottery pick. And uh, one of the few times that I was actually right. Uh, I was going to say, not many, not many. Um, but you, you've had such a long relationship with Gordon. And for him to leave, I think you're probably happy in a sense. He, he, he got paid. He got paid a ton of money to go to Charlotte. But how hard was it to watch the last three years for Gordon? It's not how you drew it up. It's not how Gordon drew it up. You, you, again, you've had that relationship with him that goes much deeper than that of a, a coach and player. Well, I can't talk about all the stuff with regard to – decisions this week and everything else so um, first and foremost obviously um, you know known each other forever and and had a great run um, and he's been a heck of a pro all the way through and I probably should leave it at that right now and I'll have plenty of time to um, go into that at a later date fair enough all right you uh, about to, let's talk about player that we know is going to be back with you and back with you and the organization for quite a while. Uh, and that, of course, is Jason Tatum. And um, uh, I don't know, where do you start? I mean, uh, is he, uh, w what pleases you most about the way he's developed? Yeah, well, I think um, we're really, I think we've got, we've been very fortunate that we had those two um, high draft picks in Jason and Jalen. They joined teams that were really competitive um, right from the get-go, and they were asked um, to play big roles and again, adding value to winning. That's hard. When you're drafted that high, usually you're drafted into a situation where they're building towards that down the road. And it's been, you know, it's been a, I think a big part of their growth has been the responsibility they have to play with. You know, I think that when you're drafted into here and you already have the tradition and history of the Celtics, and the expectation of, of this area, um, in addition to being drafted into a good team that is competitive, I think that there is a lot of responsibility. And so I think that that is added to their game. And then they just are great workers. Um, they really get after it. They're great competitors. They're team guys. Um, I mean, you guys know, I've been around them a lot, really smart and you know, for, for Tatum in particular, I think he, he came in, um, Bob, as a guy that probably was as ready um, emotionally and, um, you know, as anybody probably have ever seen. We had, we've had so many guys um, through, and, and I thought that Jalen also exceptionally high in that and also so curious, and you just knew with the combination of all the things that they brought to the table that they would get better. I never thought, and, and I think that this is a real testament to them. You know, I knew they were good and I knew they would be good for a long time. And I knew they were guys you wanted to have as, as big, huge parts of your franchise. You would have told me they've done what they've done in the playoffs through the first three and four years of their career. That's pretty unusual numbers wise. Um, but it's also just a reminder to all of us, like we're, we're, we've relied on them. Like we've leaned on them. Like it hasn't been, you know, the age is the age. We need you to be great now. And those guys have embraced that. And it's been fun to watch them grow. But I think that responsibility that comes with playing here on a good team has helped that because it challenges you. Do they compete in a friendly sense in, in any way? You know, do they yeah. drive each other? They have Isn't a good relationship. Any? They drive each other. Uh, I think they um, have brought out the best in each other. We thought that the, the, the combination of, you know, the way that they played and their strengths coming out as draft picks complemented each other well. And then you also had two very versatile wings. I mean, I think Jalen's best moments 
um, his rookie year often came when we had him in as a starting two when Avery was hurt. Um, now he's played as much four as he has Man. two. Yeah. You know, he's so versatile. And Tatum plays all over the court the same way. Um, so we knew that it would complement each other greatly defensively because they bring a lot of the same strengths, um, especially with their length and athleticism and versatility. Offensively, it just felt like it would, it would really fit with Jalen's ability to powerfully drive, make the next right play, be physical at the rim. His finishing's improved. His shooting is great. And then Jason's, uh, you know, Jason's just got, he's always been able to find the, find the bottom of the net. When the ball hits the net, it looks like it's supposed to. Jason is, among other things, the most famous father of a toddler that I have ever seen in my 50 plus years of covering the Celtics. And I mean that it's, it's such an endearing part of, of his persona. Uh, how does that I don't know, factor into making him the, 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 everything that he is. I mean, it, it's not a normal circumstance for a young player, you know, to be in the specific circumstance that he is with Deuce. And, and it's not, uh, it's not a show. He's, he is a great dad. Like he's a, he's terrific. He, he loves Deuce. He spends every waking minute that he can with him. He is, uh, he always has him around and, you know, I think that was a, the tough part for everybody of being away. But you could you could tell when Deuce showed up at the bubble, that was like the best day of the bubble by far um, for Jason. <laughs> and I thought that that was cool. He, he's a great dad. And, and um, I love the fact that um, that that is that is he is he's taken that responsibility as his number one and he's good at it. Brad. The, the one thing I, I guess for me with Jason that I saw towards the end of last season was you allowing him to make plays with the ball in his hands, not just scoring, but to see kind of what he can do, making others better, facilitating. What, what's the area you want to see uh, him make another jump with for next season? Well, I think at this point it's about um, there's always jumps to be made. I think, you know, we talk often about getting a couple more easy baskets a game, yep. you know, whether that's off a curl, whether that's off a cut, whether that's off a back cut, cause you're being overplayed or off an offensive rebound or running in transition and getting a layup. I think all of those things, you know, when you're a great player, those easy baskets add up, but they also help you see the ball go through the net one more time. And when great players see the ball go through the net, those impossible shots they make are easier. And so I think that that's a huge part um, of our focus in the off season, which isn't much of an off season, obviously, and there's not many weeks to do that, but we can work on those things, you know, right when we get back to practice, because those are more emphases than something you really need to improve upon, right? He's got the skill to curl, finish, and take contact and all that other stuff. Um, so I think that that's the, the thing that I would say you're right about his passing. I thought that the way that he made plays for everybody else, especially in the bubble, especially in the playoffs, was a, even another jump. Uh, if you looked at the first 17 games of the season, both Jalen and Jason improved in almost every statistical category in the 17 playoff games when the intensity is at its highest. And I think that that's a huge jump for those two guys. And I think their ascension was certainly a huge part of why we were, were where we were. I think Jason's passing and his reading of different actions was a, he's always been great at seeing the court, but he saw so many different kinds of defenses, which he hadn't seen as much before. Saw some run and jump right before the pandemic uh, began. Um, he saw a lot more blitzing off pick and rolls. He saw a lot different matchups than he had seen. So he, he was like, Oh man, this is like new. So you better be, better be able to react quick. And, you know, you feel pretty good about yourself when, you know, you're isolated top of the key and the other team runs another guy at you. You know, that's a, that, that makes you feel pretty good, but then you realize you got to get rid of it pretty quick. Um, and he did a great job of that. He, he transitioned very quickly in making those right reads off of those plays. Brad, you have already spent more time as head coach of the Boston Celtics than you spent as head coach at Butler, seven to six. And in one year, I, I, I could it feels go like lot, in one year. <laughs> I could go a long way with this, a lot of different ways. But what what was the biggest uh, revelation? I'm gonna so I say when you made this transition into the NBA. 
Yeah. That um, he didn't have to recruit anymore, that his phone never rang and, and how happy yeah. he was about that. <laughs> right, Brad? Bob, when you drive, when I drove home, like my second or third year in Boston, um, which, uh, you know, the, we were in Waltham and I was going south. And so it was like I was I was sitting in traffic a lot and I was like looking for people to call <laughs> when I when I drove home, when I was working at Butler, I had to drive around the block eight times before I pulled into my garage because I had two calls waiting all the time. <laughs> and that's a big difference. Um, the transitions, it's just a different game. And it's, um, you told me this, Bob, I'll never forget. We were at a, uh, at an event, maybe it was an ABCD event that you and I have done with doc over the years where, and you told me this, you go, you, I, you knew a lot more about the NBA than I did. Like I was just a, I was just a, a puppy in that and didn't really probably know what I was getting myself into. I thought I knew. Um, and luckily I had great support, um, players, uh, management owners and everybody else. And they, and they didn't expect me to know everything, um, or have every right answer. And, you know, I really appreciate that first group. I've said this a lot, um, been interviewed about it a couple of times. You know, I had Ron Adams as an assistant coach and, and I'd run things by him and he'd say, yeah, that might work. No chance. Um, don't even try it. Uh, yeah, what the hell? Try it. You know, you know, he'd just kind of be my, he was my editor. And that's what mm -hmm. he, he, he came here to do. That was really helpful and impactful. And then, you know, I have to say all the time, we, we used to try different things that we had tried at Butler. And, you know, one of the things was we, we'd try some zone uh, at different times. And the guy who really embraced it was Rondo. And that really helped sell it to not only that team, but the rest of the teams. And I, I thanked him for that. Um, when I ran and ran into him in the elevator in the bubble and <laughs> a couple of times, you know, I just think that those are without, you know, Gerald Wallace accepting not playing at all without Rondo being what he was to me without those 42 guys that came through in those first 18 months, all being willing to give us a shot. We probably don't, you know, stay around. And so I appreciate them for that quite a bit. Brad, where, where's Kemba at right now uh, physically? Obviously, he didn't look great in the bubble. You could see he wasn't Kemba. I mean, we've seen Kemba. I've seen him forever. You've seen him uh, way too long as well, dating back to college. Uh, where's he at right now, and, and how much do you have to manage him uh, with the short layoff in, in the offseason? Yeah, he's going to – I mean, he's, he's working – exceptionally hard on just continuing the, the key to this whole thing with him is just strength in the knee. And so um, just continuing to take this opportunity when we're not playing, when we're not practicing um, to really focus on that very similar to what we did at the beginning of the bubble. I think that there will be a transition like that because of the short, because of the shortened season, the shortened off season, you know, I don't expect, um, you know, it'll be some time before he's going full speed for us. For sure. Meaning that he might, he might miss, he might miss the beginning of the season, Brad. We'll see how that all goes. We haven't settled on any timelines. This is more of a like plan appropriately thing so that he can play and play uninhibited as he moves forward. A lot like the bubble. Again, the, the bubble was unique because you went basically four months off. So there was a different challenge there and that ramping up was a big threat to everybody. But certainly, if he if he had a situation like his, where we, if he goes too fast too soon, that probably wouldn't have been good. Here, it's you're just too soon to the season, yeah. and so I anticipate again, you know, it'll will be slow with him um, as the season starts, as practice starts. Brad, I uh, I proclaim myself to be the regional president of the Marcus Smart Fan Club, and I once wrote that given all the good things he does, it's okay with me if he wants to occasionally try to kick the ball in the basket from outside the arc. How does Coach uh, Stevens uh, balance off that yeah. offense-defense dichotomy with Marcus Smart? Well, Marcus has um, an unbelievable competitive spirit, as you know. That's why you're the president of his fan club. Um, he has an, He's a home run hitter. Um, he is... Um, you know, the way that he plays is contagious. You know, I think that the way that he defends has been well documented. It makes everybody else around him better. And, you know, I think that the, 
the positives of that are 99.999 to 0.001, right? And I think that ultimately he's gotten better in his ability to make plays, make shots. I think his offensive game has really improved. He's just improved as a player. I think he's a, he's a better player than he was six years ago. He's a better player than he was three years ago. Um, and we're going to need him to continue to do that. We're going to need him to continue to improve. We're going to need him to continue to be a guy that does all those good things. And, you know, he can swing for the fences in several times a game. And there will probably always be a couple, Bob, where, you know, it's you probably should have let that curveball go, <laughs> right? But, you know, I think that there's a reason why he's won as much as he has. And, you know, I think it's really important that he knows that we all believe in him. And I think it's really important that he plays with unbridled confidence. But I do think that part of that step is a, as to everybody's next level is just being able to manage that even a little bit more every year. And so we have utmost confidence that he's going to be an incredibly impactful player because that's all he's been since he's been here. We have utmost confidence he's just going to keep improving. And um, that's part of the improvement. So you've given Marcus the green light to shoot the three. Uh, you've allowed Daniel Tice to shoot the three. Would you let Bob Ryan have the green light to shoot the three? Well, I've never seen him shoot it. Daniel Tice shot 40%, didn't he, like two years ago? He didn't shoot I know. it. Well listen, year, but... you know how much I love you. You know how much I and, – and Bob, listen, Bob is going to get on you more than even I am. Uh -oh. um, that you let everybody let it fly, which, listen – to each their own. Yeah. I'm not sure I would give Daniel Tice the same green light. Or Marcus Smart's a different guy to me because he guards like he does. So to me, you do whatever the hell you want as long as you're guarding the way Marcus Smart does. Um, Bob Ryan shot, I, I wouldn't give him the green light. No. Uh, I like good the Chris shot. Ford school. Uh, I'm a one-hand set shooter. And in fact, I did have three-point range, but – I would need a little time to get it off. Yeah. If there was a strong closeout, I would have been in trouble, Brad. So that, uh, you know, I need a lot of space, you know, but, but, uh, but know, I would have cranked them up there. Believe me. You know, one of the things I think we'll all take you a layup, Bob first, and we'll all take you getting fouled and two free throws first. And then after that, if you're open from the corner, let it fly. Yeah. yeah. That's very, very lucky. Yeah. Well, let's talk about this for that. a second. You were like, ahead, Bob. you had to have been raised the old school way in Indiana of, you know, the, the game is inside out the start. And that's the way we were all taught. The game was, it was inside out. And so we all know what it's become. Was there any, did you have any little hesitation in, in, in transitioning yourself into the philosophy of, of the, the modern NBA with the three point shot? Yeah. At, at Butler, we never we never were able to play inside out. It was very rare, right? You're not posting very many guys. If you are, it's usually a six five linebacker, right? And because you don't, you're not you're not necessarily getting the um, best centers in the country or the guys that everybody would post the most. Now we had some guys you could throw it down there too, but even then, you know, when you look at a post up and what it is, just from an efficiency standpoint, there are plenty of times where a post is a great play. But the post is not as big of a threat as, you know, a, a cut to the rim as a finish at the rim off the drive, a, um, you know, multiple movement, multiple pick and roll possession, a inside out play. And so I think it's changed a little bit from the standpoint where I do think the game is desired to be inside out by every single one of us. Um, we all want layups first. We all want to get fouled first and we want the ball to touch the paint first or at the very least there to be a paint threat first. Mm. And so whether that's a big rolling to the rim, a guy that curls and creates help, whatever the case may be. And then at the same time, I think teams are all over the league. I think we were like middle of the pack in three point attempt percentage, you know, a number of threes attempted per game versus your other shots. Um, every team's shooting those quicker, right? Because of the, efficiency of the shot over the long haul there's no question there are times where it can be too quick um, there's no question that there are times where you know taking a sidestep three doesn't make as much sense as just shooting a 15 pull-up for some 15 foot pull-up for some guys you know but 
um, you know, well, I think in the big picture, you want that inside out pain attack three over a challenged long two. But I still think it's interesting. I, we're talking about posting a little bit more as we look at our roster and look at who we would play where and everything else. And um, there's, you know, playing off the pass off the post and playing off cutting off the post, I think have been things that you saw, you know, back in the day. And one of the reasons why, as you know, Bob, the Celtics played inside out so well so long as they had great players <laughs> to throw that ball to and uh and they had they demand double teams and those guys were willing passers to make the right play out of it i think it's safe to say that there has not since mikhail and parish been a comparable duo of mm. low post greatness on the same team the game has evolved away from it of course but the, the sheer talent if, if you showed videotape you know to some kids today of that, they would it'd be like looking at a, a, a outer space. They wouldn't believe that that actually happened. Well, you watch, and we we all we all I'm sure at the start of quarantine, especially those of us, all three of us living in this area, when you turned on the TV at night, it wasn't live games. It was games from the '80s. It was games from before that. And the we 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 just came in here and were or we were zooming and asking Danny like, Danny, how did you guys score with? Nobody was standing outside the three, so there was less space. Right. Everybody was bigger, and that just tells you how good those guys were scoring in the post and um, and how good they were cutting and how good they were passing. You know, I loved watching. It was fun to watch those games with Walton throwing those passes wow. over his ear, and Mikhail had every move, and Parrish doing what he did, and obviously Bird could post a matchup. Like, that was fun to watch. But I do think that – you know, we'll certainly – we've looked to post our wings at different times over the last few years, and we'll probably do a little bit more of that as we enter this season. Brad, how, how much are you aware – I was on a radio station the other day defending you. Some guys were defending you as well on the radio show. Some guys were killing you. Like, he can't win the big one. And I tweeted out something the other day. I'm like, seven years, three Eastern Conference Finals – one Eastern Conference semi, all in the last four years, by the way. Um, you know what I think of you as a coach. I, I, I hope you do. Uh, forget about the, the person, the character, all that. Uh, but I start, you know, I'm defending you here, and I'm thinking to myself, like, what is wrong with people here? H how much are you aware, and how much do you view last season, how it ended as a disappointment, uh, if you do? Yeah, I mean, listen, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, and it, that is what it is. And, you know, I don't, I don't wake up every morning hoping that 100% of the people that I come across on a day-to-day -day basis think I'm a great coach. That doesn't really even cross my mind. You know, I'm just trying to do the job that I am lucky to have as well as I can. And that's, that's that. Um, I was really, you know, I think that we've been really fortunate to be in the mix. And I think one of the things you want to do is give yourselves a shot. I think when you look at last season in its whole, and it was a long season, right? Um, if you would have told me we ended where we were at the start of last season after losing what we lost, I would have said that was a hell of a run. Yeah. And when we were in it, like you always are when you're in it, and it ends earlier than you want it to, which is obviously unless you win it, um, going to end earlier than you want it to, then – you know, there's that sour taste that's left in your mouth the rest of the off season. And listen, we didn't, we did not play our best basketball um, in some parts of that Miami series. We did play well in other parts. Uh, I said this after they beat us, they were a better team. They deserved to represent the East in the way that they played um, in the way that they um, executed all the way through the game on both ends of the court and and they deserve that. And I don't want to take anything away from them when I say that we didn't play our best. But we all know that we, we need to play better and, and we will do everything we can to do that. But as far as like, you know, I understand the expectations here. I understand that. And I also understand how hard it is to win. And I'm just going to keep doing my best. And as I've said all along, when you're in this, you learn pretty quickly. Um, with the excessive praise that's undue and the criticism, yeah. 
that it doesn't really never, matter. You've never really had the criticism. I mean, honestly, like mm. Butler, you never really had it a little bit here in Boston, but not a whole lot, yeah. right? And well, I don't, I guess it doesn't really, I guess the, what I'm saying, Jeff, is, is as long as we're all working in one direction and you're, you're, you just stay yourself and you don't let that affect you, you know, you don't let that affect your emotions. I think it's important to, you know, pay attention to um, what's positive and, you know, we don't, I don't need necessarily anybody's validation. I'm just trying to do my job as well as I can. And once it's not good enough and they tell me it's not good enough, I'm going to say thank you and have uh, so much. Um, I, I'm not, it's not, a, it's not over my head that I, that I uh, understand the responsibility and how fortunate I am to be the coach of the Celtics. So, you know, I think that just give it our all and let the chips fall where they may. Well, I can't I say that I, any, any overt criticism is crazy, of course. Uh, uh, I, I remember thinking when you got the job, I said, uh, when the contract's up with six years, you're going to be younger than Eric Spolstra is today. <laughs> and now you've arrived at that juncture, and Eric Spolster is, is ascended to, right, at the top of the, of the list, uh, uh, right up there with, I guess if we put Pop in one category, put him on the side, right? He's the Potter Familius of all you guys right now. But, but Eric Spolster is, is obviously proven over time because, you know, there were doubts about him uh, and, and whether he was capable of, of handling the whole situation in Miami. I think he's proven himself rather well, don't you? Uh, so this, you know, I, I could not respect him more. He's an amazing basketball coach, but he's a, he's such a humble guy, you know, and I don't, I didn't know Eric. I don't know Eric all that well, except I passed him on a walk in the bubble every day for 95 straight days and <laughs> multiple times. And you know, he's just a, he, he's, he's a good person and he's done a hell of a job. He, his teams always play really hard. It hasn't always been, you know, perfect. Right but that's not what it's going to be. It's an imperfect game. And um, what you do is you put your best, your best, your best foot forward and damn, he's, he's tremendous. And, and you know what, Bob, there's, there's so many great coaches in this league and, you know, I I've learned a ton every year from the guys that have gotten fired. Like everybody can really coach. And so, um, you know, you just count yourself lucky to be one of them and uh, you don't get caught up in comparing you know, I certainly have never gotten caught up in that because if I did, I would rank myself 30th out of 30. <laughs> um, and if we included the fired coaches, I'd be however many fired coaches at the bottom of that. What's the, um, what's the coolest story from the bubble, Brad? What, what's something that happened that you'll kind of, maybe not even on the court, maybe something off the court in the hotel, or like you said, walking around the track and, you know, talking to, to Spo for a while, whatever it was. Well, I think there are some, so I had, um, uh, good friends with Angela Duckworth, who wrote the book Grit, uh, and she's a professor at Penn. And I talked to her right before we were going to the bubble and said, what do you think this will be like? And how do we kind of maintain our edge as we're going through this? And, and she said, I think it'll be really hard at the start. And she said, I think there will be ups and downs along the way, but more ups. Like you just have moments where it's going to be tough, especially when you're practicing and not playing games. She said, but when it's over, it's going to be what you tell your grandkids about. And regardless of result, I'd say that's probably going to be the case um, because it really was a incredibly unique uh, experience. I'd say the two things, I'll give you one on the court and, and one off of it. So I'd say off of it was the whole week um, when Jacob Blake was shot in Kenosha and the um, Bucks decided not to play and then everybody followed suit. The, all of the discussions all of the um, raw emotion that whole week was like really memorable and really impactful. Um, and I think that the players and coaches and everybody else that went down there with the idea that it was really important to not only play well and find joy in the game you love, but, but also to use this platform to, to inspire and to inspire. Um, you know, I, I think obviously voting became a huge push um, in the league and from that moment even more of one and um that week was really impactful on the court 
I would say that our first game we played in the exhibition games, we got drubbed by Oklahoma City. That's right. And there were no fans. And I knew we were going to get drubbed immediately because Chris Paul was by far the loudest person in the gym. And, <laughs> you know, I think, I, think, I think I was getting back into, you know, coaching again. And I think our players were getting back into playing. And we were all just kind of waiting for the game to come to us. And, and this guy's just like directing the whole place. I mean, he, he's, and it's the only voice you could hear. You know, usually you can hear guys, but you can't, they don't impact you or they don't have that like right. presence that impacts both teams. Chris had that presence that day. And that was a great lesson for us. It was a great lesson for our players that they have to be the louder team in this environment because there's nobody else here. And it was a great lesson for our staff that all of us had to be a little bit louder to add not only to what we were all trying to accomplish, but to the energy of the building, mm -hmm. you know, the buildings, I mean, you saw that the way it was presented on TV was really cool, right? It looked like a stage. You had all the people around, you had the, the music in the background, but you really, it wasn't very loud. Really? So I think that that, that talking was important. Grant, I'm sure you could hear Grant Williams. Of all, people. you can definitely hear Grant Williams. Grant never stops. I mean, no. I love Grant to death, but like he never that mouth never ever ever, which is a great thing for a locker room. I mean, I told he's such... I told I told Grant the other day, no one will ever accuse him of being subtle. <laughs> never, never. Yeah. He he's, he's very so direct. mature though. He's just. I mean, you got good locker again. You got good locker room guys. We do. Uh, I think on this team, I think you really great. Do. Yeah. So Jeff, I got to tell you, uh, I, I got it once got a good tip from from Brad uh, was the day of the championship game in 2010 okay. uh, on the morning of or day before, maybe I uh, whatever. And I said, uh, we want to go We my Dick Weiss, my great friend, Dick Weiss, and I want to go. We want to go have lunch at, uh, in Zionsville, and pay tribute huh. to the coach. Where, where should we go? And he said, well, the friendly tavern. So it was an excellent tip. We went to the friendly tavern and had an excellent lunch on that day. So I thank you for that tip. So if you're ever looking for a good tip, you know, he'll, he'll give it to you. Friendly you tavern. Go. Right. The friendly tavern. That's right. That's, it was, it, when I was growing up, it was, I think, 21 and over. So I think that's where all the parents would go after the game and, you know, complain about the way their kids played. But <laughs> by the time I was going there, I was in coaching. So I was, it's, a, it's a nice little stop. Maybe I'll, I'll head out there this year. They're, they're likely going to have the entire NCAA tournament in, in Indianapolis this year, Brad. They should uh, end it at Hinkle Fieldhouse. What, they should end it at, the, at Hinkle. You they mean should. here? Right there. That's Bob, that's a perfect shirt for this. They should. Hey, wait a minute. Don't forget this. Oh, is that all the stats of it? Yep. How, how much – do you miss college? I tell everybody, Brad, I said, listen, he's going to coach in the NBA forever – until he's ready to retire and then when he's like 60 years old now again I'm, I'm not forcing Lavelle Jordan out now okay I mean this is many years I don't know how how old are you now 40 40? 44 44 yeah. you're, you're getting old anyway when you're 60 I say you go back and you finish your career with like one year at Butler <laughs> am I crazy yep I'm crazy yeah, no, I won't be coaching when I'm 60, Jeff. That, that is <laughs> all right. I, 50, I, 55, 55. I guarantee you that you're going to be um, done before you're 60. I, you already, know what? That wouldn't surprise me at all. I've, I've already done 21 years, right? And and been a head coach for a long time. I've been really lucky, but I also um, I also recognize that there's a you know I hope there's a lot of years left, but um, you know you're never guaranteed that. We'll see where this all leads me. I, I say, I'd never say never, but you know, this is a, this has been not only such a fulfilling experience from working for the Celtics and working with who we've had a chance to work with again, but also living in Boston. Um, our family has really enjoyed it. My kids love it. I sit down with my kids, Jeff, every year at the end of the year and say, do you want your dad to keep doing it? Because I want it. Cause it, you know, it's a, it's a, it can take a toll in coaching on the, families and every year they're like oh yeah like this really? is great like where you, you were know, worried they, at they first don't ride, they don't ride the waves of the ups and downs and you talked about critics earlier i mean 
any, they can be as critical as they want on the radio. It ain't nothing like those two when I get home. They're <laughs> well, like older too. They're on me. Yeah, and my 15 year old is like, you know, he he thinks he invented the game, so he's on me all the time. So, I uh, but we love living here, and it's just been a really great transition for us. And we're still connected enough back to Indiana that we can go back there at any time. But um, you know, I don't. I don't see me uh, I don't see me moving into the college game or anywhere else anytime soon but you know we'll see well you, you and Jeff, I can, I can the hear phone. the weeping and wailing in Bloomington right now <laughs> I don't I don't uh, I, I won't get into any of that Bob but I do know <laughs> just, that my dad my I'm dad just plays, saying you don't have to say is, a word <laughs> I think it is a good opportunity to shout out the IU football team right now my dad oh. played football there and they are rolling Wow. Jeff Pinnock. I guess until this week, that was they've been fun to watch. Now that Even was a terrific week. game. Now they put they 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 showed real spunk and and grit and all that and yeah, they've got and, a little you know, bit no quit. It was they're down twenty eight and they got, got down to a hail mary. Oh, come yeah, on, they've got some stuff to them. They do. All right, well, listen, we'll we'll let you get going here. You know, you you've only got about thirty days left. I'm no. I'm I'm heading out tomorrow, maybe to Mohegan Sun. We'll see. I'm gonna wake up in the morning. See how I feel. See if Villanova, Virginia, two guys that you know pretty well, um, are going to play out there, Arizona State. And uh, hopefully I get to watch some basketball. I don't know how long the college season is going to go. So I think I'm going to go just because it, it could be my <laughs> yeah. first and, and, and last chance to watch some college hoops. I don't know. I am, I am crossing my fingers for college basketball. I'm crossing my fingers for high school basketball. I'm crossing, you know, I just think, there's so much that you get from the game and there's so much that you get from playing together and being a part of a team. And, you know, the, the great elation of winning, but the trials of losing, like there's just so much you get from that. And let alone it's entertainment for all the rest of us. I'm with you. We need college to play wow. so I can watch something. You got to watch Butler. You got to watch Butler, Brad. What else are you going to do in the next month? Watch That's, tape every day. Well, Unfortunately, when you say we're opening December 22nd, that doesn't mean that we just show up on December 22nd. I know, but you will find a way. The you most will find a way to watch Butler games. Yeah, the most important time for a coach is right now when you're planning for practice in that training camp because it's you got to get those three weeks right because if those don't go right, you don't have much practice time after that. But I will definitely watch college basketball and definitely watch Butler play Western Michigan on Wednesday. And there you go. And we'll go from there. I, I knew you'd know their opponent and their the, the, the <laughs> date. So listen, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, let Aaron Neesmith let it fly. Okay. I've seen him play before a few times. Let him shoot threes. Let him shoot it. Let him shoot yeah. it. You have All our right. blessing. Just making sure. Yeah. So you have you our blessing. Yes. Yes. And we got don't it. let Bob shoot it. Whatever. I saw that form, <laughs> that one handed set shot. Oh, that, no, no, no. I beg your pardon. No, that, that's it, Bob. <laughs> Bob, the, the episode is complete. We're, we're, you're not getting the green light off this one. All right. All right. Thanks, Brad. Appreciate it. Yep. Be safe. Be well. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in person at some point soon. Great thanks, to see you guys. Take care. Thank yep. you.